Um, Lying comes in a lot of different forms, but most of us don't like it when we see it. But there's something humorous when it's so obvious that it's a lie. That's partly why this SNL skit has humor in it, because if we honestly thought he was honestly trying to deceive us to believing the things he was saying, we'd have one or two responses, whether we are maybe both. We'd feel really sorry for him, because you're going, wow, you're not very good at this whole lying thing. And do you really think I'm that stupid that I would believe this lie? So you're insulting me on top of it. Uh, a lot of what I do, uh, I, I work with leadership teams, and uh, I coach various people within the government. And one thing I realize on a regular basis is people lie to me. And, and it, it's kind of interesting to me because there are some people that if they're lied to, they get really offended and they'll cut the relationship off. Like you get to lie to them once and we're done. And I get that. Because relationships don't work if they're built within a lie. It's not really a relationship, it's something else. It's a facade, it's a, it's a stage show, it's some sort of acting going on. So I can understand why people will cut it off, but I think based on, <laughs> I'm getting paid to sit here and try to help somebody, uh, when they lie to me, it's a real curiosity because I, I look at it and I go, okay, why, would, why is it important for you to lie about that? What's happening inside of you that the truth is more threatening than this? Because this is empty. And sure, other people may not. Sometimes I know simply because of other situations I've been in and I know the details and now I know this. Sometimes maybe it's just a little hyperbole or exaggeration, uh, but, but it's become a real curiosity to me why people would lie as opposed to tell the truth. <laughs> and lies come in all kinds of forms. I mean, this was a pretty dramatic one. I remember when we were in Brazil with Ken and uh, we were kind of late. We, were, we spent a lot of time in this little village. And as we're driving out, this woman waved our car down. And Ken, just who's friendly and stops for everybody, stopped. And she said, hey, could I get a ride with you? I'm just a couple blocks down the street. Well, we're late, but we're thinking, okay, a couple blocks down the street. She lived in the town 15 minutes away, out of our way. So she got in the cab, oh, just go here, turn here. Oh yeah, go down this street. And so we're driving and we finally get to her town, drop her off as her house. Now we're turn around coming back. And I said, Ken, what was that? I, I thought it was two blocks. And Ken said, well, here, people a lot of times, um, you know, I call it cultural because people a lot of times won't be direct. <laughs> And Peter, in his great way, said, huh, that's funny. I call it lying. And, uh, <laughs> I, and I found that really funny because it was, right? Now, in her mind, she's saying, I need to not really be honest because I might not get the ride if I'm honest. So I'll lie to get it going. And uh, once it's going, well, they'll be kind of into it and they're not going to dump me on the side of the road. And she was right. Uh, by the way, that's how most government gets its funding. The little, <laughs> hey, we just need this much. Okay, now, now we're in, so let's just keep going. But that need for lying, it, it's funny because we all seem to have it from time to time. And what I found from, I've been to a lot of countries and uh, Peter went in right after the wall fell. I went to a number of countries as the wall fell. And what I found is there's two major kind of ways of lying. And I, I call it the Enron versus Madoff. 
So if you remember, Bernie Madoff was the guy who deceived all these people, took all this money from them, built this massive, deliberately lying Ponzi scheme. And when he finally was caught, decades into it, when he was finally caught and there was no talking his way out of it, he basically said, yep, you got me. I did it. I did it all. And he, it looks like he took the fall for his whole family. We still don't know if they actually did know anything. He really was a good liar. <clears throat> then you have Enron, which was this energy company that took in all this money, all these investors' money, and invested in various energy things. But what they ended up doing was cooking the books and announcing profits that hadn't even been made yet, even from portfolios that failed, but they had these projected profits, and the whole thing collapsed. When it collapsed and they took the executive group, they all swore up and down, we never broke the law, we never did anything wrong. And so here are the two groups. Somebody who really knows they're lying and they're doing it intentionally, and someone who really deceives themselves and drinks their own Kool-Aid. And as the Iron Curtain fell and had the opportunity to work with some folks who were dealing with the despots of those areas, this is what was interesting. Because to me, I was going, how can you get, like in Romania, how can you get all these people to, be, to brutalize their own fellow citizens. H how does that happen? And what, is, uh, what I discovered is, in the middle of this massive deception, are a handful of people who really know exactly what they're doing. Yep, we know it's a lie, we're spinning the lie, and here's what the lie is. It usually has two components. One is fear, so my lie, if I want you to obey me, you need to be afraid of something that I'm protecting you from. And most of the times it was the United States. I remember walking with a guy in Albania and I kept passing these little concrete igloos. And I, I, I was thinking, these are the weirdest thing. Like they had the hole in the back and the little slot in the front that faced towards the coast. And I finally said, after like 15th one of them, I said, what are these? And he said, well, when the invasion comes, we would all go to the army, get a weapon, and then go to our assigned igloo and defend the country. And I said, who is going to attack you? And he goes, you were. I said, I, what? And I said, look, I, I hate to tell you this, but most Americans don't even know Albania exists. And if you said the name, and they did know it existed, they'd be hard pressed to find it on the map. And if there was an invasion, it would happen 300 miles offshore with rockets and missiles, and everything would be destroyed. You'd be blind, deaf, and dumb before anybody even showed up. And you could see in his face this realization of decades of being lied to and believing it. That was, that was difficult to watch, but I realized, where am I doing this? And, and the, the person, it, and here's what's amazing to me, the person that I'm best at deceiving, that I have the most artful skill to deceive, it's not my friend Peter or my wife Anne or my kids. Guess who it is? Yeah. Oh, what? I, I'm sure a number of you here go, no, I'm pretty smart. No, I'm not talking about me. I mean, you're saying to yourself, I'm pretty smart. I look, I, I know it's true. I look for facts. I look for, I'm always wanting to know what's true, and which is great. But all that skill that you have, you can easily turn on yourself and deceive yourself into some position or thought or conclusion 
And the big one is justification for things that if you slowed down, you knew probably shouldn't be happening, but you're really good at that justification. Right out of school, I worked 18 months at the Sheriff's Department and did a number of things within the jail there. And it was amazing to me how few people were guilty. And uh, of those who were guilty, there was a reason that had nothing to do with them why they were guilty, why they were caught. It was like the crime was I was caught, but if, I, if you just give me a minute to tell you a story, I'll tell you why it's not my fault that I did what I actually did. And that to me was started this whole fascination about truth and lie. And, and so we have these, uh, these despots that rely on Convince, doing something to get the masses that report to them to really believe what they're saying. So how do they do that? Well, uh, John 14. Let's look at this. I think this is... I love this opening verse because uh, Jesus is basically about to say, Look, everything we've been doing here is about to fall apart as far as you, you can tell. But I'm going to try to explain to you it's actually in the plan. But for you, it's going to feel and look like it's falling apart. So he starts and says, let not your hearts be troubled. I, I love that. I, I love that. Uh, it's really hard for me to do that. But he's telling, he's saying it in a way as if, I have some say over that, whether my heart is troubled or not. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Now, even now, when I read that, I, I feel like what Thomas is about to say. Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> I know the way to where you're going. And Thomas, and I love Thomas, both Thomas and Peter were, were the two who kind of spoke out loud what everybody was thinking. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And then Jesus said this really powerful triad. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And he was basically saying, look, I'm going to go to the Father, and you know the way. And they're saying, we, we don't know the way. And he's going, well, well, yeah, you, you know me, so you know the way. And they're still really confused about this. If you had known me, and, and this I think is really interesting, uh, which is partly why I like being part of this church, because at the first part, he's talking like you get it, and you're part, and you're part of this. Then he switches to this tense, like, oh, you don't get it, and you're not part of this. Because he said, ah, no one comes to your father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known the father also. For now you do not know him. For now you do know him and have seen him. So he's basically saying, oh, I was talking to you like you got it. You don't get it. So you, you do know me, but you don't know that you know me. Well, Here's one piece that we can take away from this. Jesus is the way to the Father, and he is the truth. And there's articles in front of all this. this there are seven places in John where Jesus says he is the thing. So he is the shepherd. He is the vine. He is the door. And it's really interesting because he uses all these very, what we would consider, common things, especially back then it was common to see shepherds, it's common to see vines. Uh, for us, it's common to see doors. 
And he was basically saying, look, it, you're going to encounter these things in life. All these things are pointing to me if you're paying attention. So it's almost like saying, look, every time you go through a door and you're trying to get to the other side, that's an image of me. That's just an image of a door. I'm the door. So every time you put your hand on a handle and open that door, think of me and think of how I am the way you get to the other side of where you want to go. And where do you want to go? You want to be with the Father. That's your deepest desire, is to be one with the Father. And I'm that door. Every time you cut, you know, for them it was a little more tangible, but every time you prune that vine and you think of, oh, the grapes are coming off this vine, I'm going to make wine, I'm going to make juice, I'm going to make all kinds of stuff out of this fruit of this vine. He goes, yeah, right, you are. That's an illustration. So every time you work with that vine, think, I am the vine. That's just an example of me. I am the shepherd. Every time you see a shepherd do something good for its sheep, or you as a shepherd go do something good, you think of me because I am that thing. Well, he's the truth. This is something, uh, I remember a long time ago, you said this to me. The closer you are to the truth, the closer you are to Jesus. And I like that. Because the, the truth, the truth is really hard to figure out sometimes. I mean, if you just turn on the news, right, this whole Gaza thing, it, depending on the channel, it's very much this side or that side. There's truth in there somewhere, but doubtful we're going to get it in a 30-second headline, right? What we're going to get is somebody's agenda, which I found was the way despots move through the world. And let me say this, despots are just an extension of an evil one who wants to deceive us all, to believe things that just aren't true. And to put us in a state where we don't know the way, we don't know the truth, and we don't know the life. Here's the good news. Thomas, you do know the way. Put your name in there. You do know the way. You do know the truth. You do know the life. And you may say, I, I don't know the way. It's partly why I'm here, because I'm not sure what it is or how it works. I'm telling you by faith and the authority of Scripture, you do know the way. You do. Might be hidden through a bunch of confusion and worldly distractions and that sort of thing, but you do know the truth. And you do know life. But there's a lot of distractions. Well, if I can keep you distracted, if I can keep you in fear, and that's, that is one of, the, that is, <laughs> it's interesting. We've done a lot of brain studies now of how your brain works, right? And so part of what sets us aside from the animal kingdom is this highly developed frontal lobe and cerebral cortex where we do things like math problem and learn language and, so, and have arguments, logical debate, and figure out patterns and watch them and predict them. Uh, that, that's an amazing capability we have. Deeper in your brain, there's a set of brain parts that make up what's called the limbic system. And the limbic system is where your emotions reside, but it's, it's kind of the system, if you think of at some point in your life, you, you have a, a fender bender, right? You run into somebody, wrecks your car. Uh, in that moment, your limbic system does a whole bunch of stuff. It says, what were the smells, what were the sounds, what were the sights, what were the... And you could be 20 years later and smell that same smell, and all of a sudden, you're going, I feel like I'm about to hit a car. 
and you could be just sitting at your desk. That's your limbic system. It, it has this great ability to maintain your existence. It's always driving to survival. What we've discovered now with advertising is that if I can talk to that limbic system, I almost am guaranteed a sale, or at least I'm guaranteed the desire to buy my product. So if you watch back kind of like the mid-90s and you look at a car commercial, it was, uh, well, the car does this many miles per hour and it has this much horsepower and real Corinthian leather seats and you know all, all this stuff that are very cerebral, tangible descriptions to try to get you to say, well, I like Corinthian leather, leather, not sure what it is, but it sounds good. And so maybe, ooh, $40,000, yeah, I didn't, mm, nah. It, it's a logical argument. But now, if you think of McConaughey in the Lincoln, right? Maybe life has adventures I haven't yet discovered. And you're going, what, what is this, Lincoln? And you're going, what are they doing? Turns out that ad campaign wasn't really that successful, but they already paid McConaughey a ton of money, so they ran, they ran them. But what they were trying to do is get in that limbic system. It's, it's why realtors bake cookies when you go do a house walkthrough. It's so that you flash back to hopefully some memory of something you enjoyed, because if I can get your limbic system to say, ooh, I want that, now you're left with your logical system trying to talk you out of it. Hold on, we can't just go out doing everything we want to do. Have you noticed that the world is trying to tell you, if you want to do it, just go do it? And don't worry, only think of the moment. Don't, don't worry past this moment. Not really, not really a healthy way to exist. It almost sounds like it's from someplace other than God. Well, living by impulse, I, I think at the end of Judges where it says everyone did what was right in their own eyes, and it was a hellscape to live back then. And I think the enemy's trying to get us back to that place. And it doesn't matter which side politically you fall on, but it does matter what truth is. And to find it is not easy. So if you want to know a political truth, well, there's lots of ways to find that. But if you want to know a spiritual truth, that's something altogether different, isn't it? So, here, here was an interesting time. In the 1600s at the Reformation, uh, they were trying to figure out, it, it, there were all these things about solo scriptoria from Luther. Hey, scripture is given. We don't have to go through the priest. You can read it for yourself. You can have a relationship with God. You don't have to go through someone else. You don't have to rely on somebody to explain it to you and the rules of God and this sort of thing. So there's this big explosion of freedom, of individual freedom and community freedom to explore God and to seek him. And out of that, in England, Francis Bacon uh, came up with, he, he basically said this, look, God made us and he wants us to know him. And he gave us these five senses. I'm going to gamble that if I use these five senses to figure out this world around me, I'm going to know God better. I'm going to discover him at least as he's revealed himself in this physical world. So he came up with what we rely on as the scientific method, which it's pretty straightforward. You ask a question, hey, why does, uh, why does my jar break when I put it out overnight in the freezing weather? And then you have a hypothesis. Well, I think maybe the ice expands and it breaks the jar. So then you do an experiment. Next night, you put one out and see if it breaks. And you leave one inside, see if it doesn't break. Then you have a conclusion, yep, ice expands and it broke the glass. Then you do something 
that most of us don't want to do. You tell everybody else what you found out so that they can have an interaction with you, try the experiment themselves, and come back and go, no, you were wrong, or yes, you were right. And this was the interesting thing when you read Bacon's reason for this last step, and it was because he said, I am the most easiest person to deceive in my life, and if I choose not to report out, then all I am is living in this isolated world of my own self-deception. So how do you find truth? I think one very important part of it is community. That doesn't mean you shouldn't have your prayer time reading scripture and this sort of thing, but it's in community where I find out who I really am and I actually get to live out and dare I say, test these principles that God has, that he's given me. So if, if I feel like I want to be mad at Peter and push him over, he may allow that at one time, but if that's all I do every time I get with him, because that's just how I feel, all of a sudden he's going, you know, I, I, we're going to limit how many times that we hang out together. But if I learn that giving, as Christ is telling me, loving, grace, this sort of, if I live that out in community and find out, oh, there's a lot of life in this thing called grace. And then I start finding truth and I find it not because I sat and cognitively walked through it, but because I lived it. I, I walked in it. And dare I say, I took the risk of putting me second and somebody else first, believing that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Well, truth takes, takes effort, and uh, I, w- I want to kind of bring us into this last piece of anxiety. Uh, if... I can get you to live in fear, I can get you to be anxious. And if you're anxious, you're far more easier to control. And here's the thing we found out from brain studies. You can either be very logical and thoughtful, or you can be really emotional, but you can't be both. And it's kind of a continuum. The more emotional I can do, and I I worked with some guys who did interrogation, uh, and they would, they would clearly say, look, you got to find some way to get them really, really mad. Because if they're really, really mad and they tell their story, they can't keep it straight if it's a lie. Because the emotion gets a hold of them. And they start moving impulsively on this emotional piece. So truth, truth, when it's actually there, here's an interesting thing. If you're actually moving in truth, you can be mad about something and still convey the truth of it. But if you're living in a lie and I get you emotional or somebody does, the real truth comes out. It's funny, I I think of, uh, there's a phrase I've heard many times because I go and hang out with these folks after work. Have you, I, I don't know if you know this, a lot of government people just like drinking after work. A lot of cops like drinking after work. I think most people like drinking after work is what I've discovered. And when they get a little too much in them, they'll say some stuff. And this is where I love hanging out with them at this point because I go vino veritas, right? A, a truth from wine. And many times people will say to me the next day, hey, just forget what I said. It was just the alcohol talking. And I go, no, that was you talking because your whole frontal lobe was saturated with alcohol and you couldn't engage it. So I finally heard what you really felt. And that's the power of emotion dimming your cerebral cortex. So when you're mad, If you hear somebody say, I was mad, I didn't mean it, odds are, no, that's what they really did mean. 
and it was the anger finally got it to come to the surface. Now, somebody may be angry and say something just to hurt you, that's different. But a lot of times to really find where somebody's coming from, emotion has a, a really good point in it. But anxiety, if I can get you anxious, and, and here's the cool piece about anxiety, it tells me I don't believe my faith. The minute I'm anxious, it's like a little sign to me going, oh, you're not believing it right now. You're believing something else. And it's kind of a gift. I hate the gift, but it's kind of a gift when I'm anxious. And in that moment, I, and here's a really cool concept. I came across this uh, a, a little over a year ago. If, if you know the law of entropy, right, which is order to chaos. So the universe is kind of going from the state of order to this more state of disorder. Not sure exactly where it's going, but we know if I build a brand new beautiful car and let it sit there, it kind of decays and gets bad, even though nothing is really happening to it. The weather works on it, all the, and it, it's weird, but it goes from this beautiful order to a more chaotic state. So there's a thing called the entropic distance, which is, let, let's say I'm sitting at my office and they have donuts in the break room and somebody said, hey, there are donuts in the break room. And I go, awesome. I'm going to go get a donut from the break room. And I stand up, and in my mind, I create this plan, right? It's not conscious, but I created it. It's going to take me 45 seconds to get to the break room, and I get a donut. Bonus. So now I'm kind of excited about my donut, and I stand up, and the boss walks in. Says, hey, I need to talk to you about this proposal, da 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 da, da. And you're sitting there going... Oh my goodness, all my plans have been laid waste, right? And I don't know. Now, I'm speaking in terms of hyperbole, right? But what just happened there? The entropic distance, the amount of chaos that was introduced all of a sudden increased from what I had in my mind. And that's where in, when they try to do AI modeling and try to model human anxiety, that's the process they use. This in, once entropic distance increases, so think of any plan that you have, and if it's a good plan, it means one that's going to hit lots of resistance because that's how our plans work in this fallen world. As soon as we set out, something happens, and the entropic distance, the law of entropy, the amount of chaos to that goal has just now increased. And it could be something simple as, Boss is keeping me from a donut to all of a sudden I'm going somewhere and I had a car wreck. Or somebody told me uh, a loved one died or I got diagnosed with a terminal il illness. And the entropic distance becomes infinite and anxiety is right at the door. And when the entropic distance becomes infinite, what do we do? That's the moment, and here's the good news and bad news. Good news is, that's the moment where faith is built. The bad news is, that's the moment faith is built. So if you never encounter an entropic distance, I, I feel sorry for wealthy people. I mean, really wealthy people that everybody does what they say and they kind of just can speak and get what they want. Their entropic distances are really compressed and hardly have any, which means there's hardly an opportunity for faith to be built. It's almost like, geez, how are they going to get into the kingdom of heaven? It'd be like trying to stick a camel through an eye of a needle. So if you're sitting there and you're going, I know nothing but infinite entropic distances in my life. On one hand, I really feel for you. I've had those moments where life didn't seem like it was purposeful anymore because of the numerous entropic distances that I had created for myself. 
But I also know that's the place where the deepest things happen. And God in his mercy takes us through those in very cyclical ways. Sometimes he keeps us there. Sometimes he moves us in and out. But how do you know he loves you? Because he's building in you faith, hope, and love, the three, the eternal triad, the things that last forever. And so how does he insure, assure us? He ensures us by saying, look, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. And you're trying to get to the Father. And he's in me and I'm in him. You're there. You're with the Father. There's this interesting thing. Peter mentioned it. It's almost like we coordinated at the beginning here, which we didn't. But it was good because you mentioned about repetition. Repetition it's very interesting. If I can get you to chant something, I hyper-focus your limbic system on a thought or concept. We already know from lots of studies, <clears throat> if I put you in an environment, and they did, the, one recent one was, they had people set up to receive texts as part of an experiment. They didn't know what they were being experimented with, but they'd receive texts through the week. Some of the texts were just very factual. This is kind of how it works. Some were made up unfactual, actually the opposite. Some scientific facts, some uh, social facts, and this sort of thing. But they laced them with true and untrue in, a, in categories these people wouldn't have known for the most part. Then after this repetition, they found, hey, if I can repeat, certainly if I can repeat something to you over six times, there's a part of you that goes, yeah, that's, that's true. I've heard it six times. If you didn't do any other research other than hearing it, you start believing it. If though, I can get you actually to chant it rhythmically over and over, it engages this limbic system, and you start, for lack of a better word, really feeling it's true. Really feeling it's true. So what's the takeaway there? That we believe everything we believe because it's a lie? I don't think so. Because there is truth. Truth is, there is truth out there. Jesus said he is the truth. Here's what I am saying. If you start rhythmically repeating things, you better be darn sure they're true. Think of the music you listen to. What songs do you sing out loud? What are the words saying? Think of the way you talk to yourself. If you talk to yourself when you make a mistake and you say, stupid idiot, that's from hell. What you say on a rhythmic pattern goes deep in you. So make sure it's aligned with truth. Truth isn't necessarily easy to find, but it is out there. And, and the beautiful thing is, truth came to us, embodied and walked among us, and lived with us, and showed us who he was. And even as he was showing us, it was hard for us to see, hard for us to believe. If you finish reading through this chapter 14, what you find is, they were all questioning him because they were going, well, how can you go somewhere? To, I mean, how can you reveal yourself and not the whole world see it? Because they still had stuck in their mind, this guy's going to rise up. We're all going to take swords, overthrow Rome, and it's all going to be good. The Messiah's back. And he's going, no, I'm conquering something much deeper, much more profound, much stronger, much more fortified than Rome. I'm coming to conquer your heart. And to conquer your heart, it doesn't take a sword. It takes laying down and letting you 
release all your anger and your lies and your deception on me. And I'll willingly take all that to win you to myself. I, I have a son. I have three sons, one daughter. And uh, enduring is really hard. And a lot of times you feel like, this is a waste. My son was uh, in high school, got on the soccer team, and he was actually pretty good. Uh, but there were political things that happened among the kids there. It was a big school, Arapaho uh, High, and uh, he was a striker. There were a lot of people's people that wanted to play that front line, and uh, the coach told him, hey, can't play the front line, can't be a captain, uh, you're, you're going to pretty much be on the bench for the season. I'll let you on the varsity team, but that's it. And Daniel came home really sad and depressed over that and wanted to know, should he quit? And I said, well, do you love the game? He goes, I love soccer. I go, then don't quit. Just be the best soccer team person you can be given, given the restraints that have been put on you. And we talked about what that meant. And that meant at the end of the game, go and, you go and collect all the balls. And you stay, as much as you are mad at the coach, you stand right next to the coach because you never know what opportunities might come along. So they went through their practice, three weeks of practice, and finally the first game comes. And uh, he's standing by the coach. The kids have been making fun of him because he collects the balls. They thought he got punished, and that's why he was doing it. But he was just trying to help. And the two strikers had gone to the convenience store, and the game was about to start, and they weren't there. And uh, Daniel was just standing there next to the coach, and the coach looks at him and goes, where is so-and-so and so-and-so? He goes, I, I don't know. And he goes, okay, go on in. You can play until they show up. He went in, and within the first 30 seconds, scored a goal. And he ended up being the highest goal scorer for the whole district of all the teams. Took their team to a championship for the district. I'm not saying everything turns out, but I am saying when anxiety is high, when that entropic distance gets increased to the point that you're saying, what is the point? Stop for a moment because that many times is the best place you could possibly be because that's the place where the deepest change and the deepest revelations of who God is and what he wants with you and how to move through you happens. So what do you do in those moments? You love your neighbor as yourself. That's what you do. So, when Christ came to this world and he hung out with the disciples and he kept trying to explain to them what he was doing, and they kept seeing it through a different lens. They kept seeing it through this really worldly lens of a conquering Messiah. That's all they could think and understand. And at moments they saw him and were profoundly moved, but then moved back to just this worldly perspective, kind of like how we move through our life and our walk of faith, right? But when Jesus, shortly after this, he took him up into a room and he said at this Last Supper, hey, this is my body broken for you. Broken in your place so that you don't have to be broken like that. I'll be broken in your place. And for hundreds and hundreds of years, they were told, the Israelites, don't drink the blood. The life is in the blood. You cannot drink the blood of any animals. And Jesus said, hey, this is my blood 
shed for the forgiveness of sins. Take my blood and drink it into you. The way, the truth, the life, the life going into you. So as you come, know that here is the life. He's not a way or some truth or kind of life. He is the author. He's the true door, the true life. And this is what we're all trying to find in this world. This right here. Come and let him come into you. In Jesus' name. Is it possible to get John 14, 20 up here somewhere? Well, I'm talking about uh, two. We'll end with this. Um, on a practical side, it, it, especially when I said, hey, if you just, if your internal chanting is, you idiot, you screwed up, or you did it again, you're stupid, this sort of thing, um, one good way to change that chant is to preamble whatever you're doing with something that you remember to always say. I like, I'm his beloved. Are the one God, I'm the one God loves. You know, so I screw up, I'm the one God loves. Then I can usually ask the practical question if I can teach myself to go there, which is, what can I learn from this, right? What, what's, the, what's the takeaway? Obviously, it's not what I thought, so there's something I can better myself. That's on the practical side. On the other side here with John 20, uh, he he says this, which is really interesting. As, as the disciples are trying to understand where are you going, how are you going to get there, and what are these houses and everything, and what he's trying to tell them is, look, your deepest desire is to be one with the Father, and in that day, you will know, you're going to know what's already true, that I am in the Father, you're in me, and I'm in you. That you're gonna, it's true now, you just don't know it. So here's, here's the cool thing. The thing that you desire the most has zero entropic distance. You're already there. So believe the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.